morning, Kitty. Hi, Mike. How are you? Good, thank you. How's it going? It's a bit chilly this morning. It is. <laughs> it's uh, busy time. It's all very impressive. This event. Yeah, it's it's the first first conference I've done like on, on this kind of platform. Morning, Stuart. Good morning. Hi. Sorry, I'm just checking my my hair. <laughs> Hi, Katie. I oh, think we've Stuart. ever met, but yeah. nice to meet you. Am I clear? Can you see and hear me? Okay. Perfectly. Okay. Lovely. Morning, Chris. Morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Okay. I can say it is absolutely bloody freezing in this office. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Sorry we haven't met. Uh, my Hi, name is Christian Chris. TK. So has the, the heating been off for the last five months or something, Chris? Isn't no, it? no, we're not. We're not quite at that stage, Stuart. Where we're having to turn off the heating to save money. The uh, it's just lucky white heather. It's just broken. So there's there've been people in trying to fix it for the last week or so. I think they've managed to fix okay. the main office, but my fridge, uh, my fridge, my office is a fridge. So I think you could hang me in here. Okay. Okay. So. Guys, uh, so yeah, I was going to say, Chris, if you've got um, Let's see. um blinds, and we've got we're getting we're more people are joining the session now that are we're live. Oh, fantastic! There we go. That's much better. Thanks, Chris. I was going for the uh, the shadowy, moody, moody look, but okay, you can see my face now. So we'll, we'll get started in uh, three minutes at 10.40. I hope I don't ask too many difficult questions. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome for joining. Thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, the purpose of this session is that we'll be talking about safety for the next hour. Um, and keeping with the conference theme, we'll be looking at pathways to 2030. I am Mike Bradshaw. I'm the global head of HSSEQ at VShips. I'm also the chairperson of the UK Chamber's Safety Culture Working Group. And I'm joined today with a fantastic panel of experts who share the same passions around safety. Across the panel today, we have representation from owner-operators, 
third party management, loss prevention, and um, from the flag administration. Um, if I could ask the panel members to introduce themselves, um, and we'll, we'll start with Chris, then, uh, sorry, with Katie, then Chris, and then Stuart. Katie. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Good morning to everybody. It's a real honour to be with you today, Albert, uh, through this virtual forum, but it's very impressive. Um, my name is Katie Ware. I'm the director of UK Maritime Services, which be UK's Maritime Coast Guard Agency, and I'm also the UK's permanent representative to the IMO. Um, in a nutshell, I am responsible for the UK flag and port state control regimes, which includes survey and inspection, the UK safety, security, environmental uh, regulatory regimes, seafarers training, navigation safety, and the UK ship register. So that's a brief run through of my portfolio. Pretty much everything then, Katie. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Chris? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is Chris McDade. I'm the Vice President of Gas Operations for TK. I'm responsible for, well, effectively, all operations, both ashore and afloat. A little bit on my background, I'm actually, uh, well, I'll say this now because it's been a number of years, but a former deck officer, so been at sea for a number of years before coming ashore and now finds myself uh, here in, back in Glasgow. Okay, thank you for that. And Stuart. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a delight to to be here this morning and join you. I wish I wish we were on a stage, meeting each other over a coffee, but uh, here we are, and hopefully next year we can we can do that. Uh, I head up the loss prevention department of the UK P and I Club and responsible for a number of loss prevention initiatives, reporting to the board of the club, who are hugely uh, positive and enthusiastic. And supportive of our loss prevention uh, initiatives. Um, other than that, uh, we look after the uh, monitor quality of the the ships entered with the UK club, which is of the utmost importance. Our members improve and work on their safety. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, also joining us, also joining us today off camera is um, Melanie White from the chamber. Mel will be helping us over the next hour with managing the questions and the comments that come in for, for the panel. And this is a good opportunity just to remind you about what Peter was telling us at the end of the last session about using the chat function to reach out and ask any questions that come up, that come to mind during our discussions um, on, and questions relating to the topics that we're covering this morning. The first part of this session will be a, a panel discussion and we have some suggested topics and questions from the Chamber based on feedback from the Chamber's membership. Uh, and then we will be opening it up to a, a much wider Q&A session uh, to finish. So with that in mind, let's let's get started. So the first question that, that we've been asked as a, as a panel to discuss, and we can hear from those joining us as well, is what will be the likely state of shipping uh, safety performance in 2030? Obviously, we're looking beyond the short term into the medium term. So I would, I would appreciate the panel's views on this. So let's start with, uh, with Chris. Chris, what do you, how do you see safety performance in 2030? Yeah, I think uh, it's a good question, Mike. You know, obviously, 2030 seems to be the watchword that everybody's aiming for, whether it's, you know, uh, carbon or environmental. I think in terms of safety, you know, for 2019, there was, and Stuart can maybe correct me on this one, but I believe there was 41 losses uh, for ships that were over 100 gross tonnes. That's close to a 70% fall over 10 years. So I think, you know, we're now in 2021, we're on the march to 2030. I can only see that, you know, improving as time goes on. I think with the step up in regulation and risk management that we've had over the years, you know, such as robust safety management systems coming in with ISM, tightening up in procedures, this has all helped in the reduction that we've seen over the past decade. I'd say, you know, the shipping industry has progressively improved, as has the performance of my own company, but as we get closer to zero, it's becoming more and more difficult to have a significant impact and you know that race to the zero incidents which is where most owners and operators are trying to get to i think for significant changes over the you know coming years we're going to really be looking at technology 
digital digitalization automation and you know enhancements and training Automation, everybody gets a bit excited about when, you know, flagged off with autonomous ships and the lack of manpower. I don't think that's ever going to happen, not particularly for the ships that, uh, that we operate. But what we will see is, you know, smarter systems, more physical barriers when it comes to safety, which is obviously going to help to uh, to drive down. The other big one for us, and I'm sure it's the same for everyone, is the, uh, the harnessing and leveraging of data. So we're now starting to see enhanced data share between companies posted in, in initiatives such as like Shell's Partners in Safety, Hilo, where owners and operators are being far more transparent and live when it comes to the actual data. Being able to interrogate and leverage this data will enable like owners and operators to intervene, you know, when they're starting to see trends, indicators and take steps to prevent, and you know, significant incidents from happening. All these are positives, but I think, you know, safety and risk management has been around for so long. We're on a real risk of removing some basic fundamental things, such as, you know, the thing, I would call it the thinking element. You know, we have to be very careful that we don't end up uh, dumbing down safety, you know, taking decision making away from those people that are on the ground and those people that can actually, you know, manage and are well aware of the risks that are involved with the particular task at hand. We hear, I hear a lot of words from our senior officers um, at sea when they talk about micromanagement and decisions being taken away from seafarers. So we have to really be very careful of that and make sure that you know human element is really uh, at the forefront of the next leap when it comes to yeah. uh, safety performance. Ab absolutely, uh, totally agree. Um, let's hear uh, from Stuart. Do you sh share those views? Anything else, anything else from your side, Stuart? No, I, absolutely, I absolutely do share those views, and I and I am glad that Chris mentioned data. Um, big supporters of the high low uh, initiative, which is really is the leading uh, uh, loss prevention initiative, uh, taking all these data sets, looking at precursors for major events, and and hopefully in the next few years we'll, 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 we'll reap rewards for, for, for that. Um, absolutely in the industry I think we will see that coming through and more and more people understanding the data and, and putting, to, putting it to good work. But for me, for, for me uh, human performance, human element is right up there. Um, you just have to look at the major casualties in the last few years, read the flag state reports, and in most of those conclusions, in those flag state reports, uh, are the human performance, the human is at the core of all the potential mistakes that have occurred leading up to that uh, casualty. So I think it's important to understand what drives human performance. There's a lot, of, lot being written on it that you just have to Google uh, human element and there will be a number of different texts available to buy. Mm -hmm. I don't think they quite grasp trying to understand human performance and how it can be managed and incentivized through proper and regular training. So I want to see, I'd love to see better training. And what's, what's really interesting to me being at the club, we insure just over three and a half thousand ships over 1500 tons at the moment. We've got a large tug and barge book as well, of course, but the, the large ocean going vessels that we insure, uh, we see such a range in different training. Uh, some absolutely top notch and some, some not so good. And I think that um, to me, the, 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 the core there is how you, uh, how you incentivize your crew. So from right at the top, leadership, the CEO, right down to the galley boy, if you still have galley boys on ships, everyone needs to be connected. Everyone needs to feel part of the business. So why do we need to go into port at this time? Why are we loading at this rate? Where is that cargo going? Understanding the cargo and actually feeling part of the business. So I think that's the key. It's something that we're concentrating on at the club is uh, is helping members in the in the area of human element. Okay, that's interesting. Both yourself and Chris and uh, share the view about collaboration within industry and sharing of data and sharing of lessons learned. Uh, uh, that's the general theme that I'm hearing around about safety performance. Um, Katie, uh, what's your view and the view of the flag in all of this? What, where do you see safety in 2030? Um, in 2030, I suspect that, that safety will be very much around environmental safety performance. 
Um, I think that will dominate the agenda. You know, there is much talk about goals and zero emissions, et cetera, et cetera, but we've got to build these ships. We've got to survey and certify them. We've got to make sure that the people can operate them safely. And for us to do that as a, as a flag state, and this is very much where our focus is at the moment, we're going to have to adopt our regulation for the novel technologies. Um, you know, as somebody who spends a lot of time at the IMO, we're going to have to move at a real pace to get this regulation. So we're going to have to really think outside of the box. And, you know, there's two sides to this. You know, for me as a flag administration, we as a regulator, we need to develop our skills so that we can evolve and help um, innovate the technologies. We, we have a very black and white regulatory view of the world at the moment, the way that statute is written. But we are going to have to move more and more to a risk-based approach and provide equivalences to regulation as we know it. Um, I think we'll be seeing much more goal-based solutions, um, which is exciting and innovating, but it's open to much more interpretation than a you shall do this. So for me, we're really going to have to move in very different direction as a regulator. And just picking up on what Stuart and Chris have said, you know, a huge part of that is going to be training and upskilling of our people. The future, some piece of work that we're working on at the MCA is what will the seafarer of the future look like? It's going to be a very different individual to what we see in the current environment. So again, a lot around that training, we've really got to move to a different space in terms of seafarer training. And just like um, Stuart and Chris have said, for, for me and the teams, we view the safety as all encompassing. And that includes the well-being mm. and quality of life on board for seafarers. And that, that is really critical. And some people may have seen the um, is one report, the um, Social Interaction Matters, um, which was supported by the MCA and the wider um, Red Enzyme group. And that really does demonstrate that link between our people, the quality of their education, their understanding of what they're doing on board, and how that actually impacts on safety and the efficiency of the vessel itself. So absolutely for me, as we move forward, it's about being a modern thinking regulator to support the industry with new innovation, but absolutely our people will be at the heart of all of that. That's it. Um, picking up a point from the opening uh, talks during during the uh, early part of the conference, they mentioned mental well-being, and um, I think during COVID times, we've now really appreciated the connection between mental well-being and safety and engagement and uh, operational risk. So it's it's good that you mentioned that, and I know that um, many 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 companies are supporting Iswan on that social uh, interaction project, in, uh, including ourselves. And Chris is nodding there as well as well. Um, certainly, from from our side, we see 2030 all being all about the human factor and human performance. As as I think we're all agreed on the on this uh, this panel, and getting away from um, the more traditional focusing on immediate failures after incidents and looking at the culture, the behaviours, and attitudes of those at the sharp end of our business. Um, you also mentioned, uh, Katie, about. Uh, smart uh, systems and again we, I urge ship designers and uh, builders that it's it's going to be about the human factor about the ergonomics the interface to make these new smart systems and technologies user friendly or else they will create more more harm than they were set out to eliminate it's great that we also heard this morning from uh, Graham Henderson because the Partners in Maritime Safety Initiative are also doing a, a great deal of work now this year on human performance. Um, Ockham for adopting the human performance framework. Um, and all of this will require visible and felt leadership from, uh, from ourselves and from everybody that's listening in today. The, the one the one point I would like to make as I, as I round off this question is that with visible and felt leadership in mind, the UK Chamber of Shipping Safety Culture Charter is an ideal tool and framework for, for leaders to document their commitment to this journey of human performance and safety culture. So some great points there, and I see some questions are coming in which um, uh, Mel will, will pass through to us uh, at the end. So thank you for all your comments that are coming in. 
Um, moving into the next question that we have, and uh, Stuart, you, you touched upon it during your uh, piece there on safety performances. How do training regimes need to be developed to generate successful safety outcomes? Um, so I'll go with Stuart. Okay. You, you go first. Well, I think they have to be more regular. I think they have to be more regular. I think they have to be, although there's a whole hat attitude, and, I, and I'm, I'm guilty of that when I was at sea. You know, when checklists came in, when ISM came in, it was seen as being a kind of burden. It was never championed as being something that could, you know, save you, save, save the ship in the cargo. It was always seen as being a burden. So I just feel that training needs to be uh, more regular, um, more fun, um, maybe drop, drop bits of the training that you don't, that, that don't save life. You know, there's so much sort of compliance. You have to cover this, you have to cover that, you have to cover the next thing. But look at claims, look at where the incidents are happening. Let's focus on that. And that's why, I mean, and you, you, I, I've mentioned, so for example, the last few navigation casualties that we've handled at the club, it's the sort of stuff that happened, and I'm sure Katie sees this as well, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's the same, same failings that my grandfather warned me about when I went to sea. So for example, poor non-existent visual lookout. Uh, in, uh, improper non-existent bridge handover, you know, not just when there's a proper change of watch, but when the the captain comes up and relieves the second mate to go down for his dinner or his lunch, and he comes back up half an hour later, and it's just a case of, you know, off you go. And in half an hour, a lot of things can happen, especially in, in, in congested waters. And we and, and that, that we, we found one recent casualty where that was directly causative. The guy coming back on the watch had no idea, no situational awareness. He just had his... Uh, his stovies and his uh, and his bread and butter pudding or whatever he'd been eating, and he comes up to the bridge and had no situational awareness. So just a reminder about the basics, uh, and you can do that quite easily um, uh, without much too much time in a training a training situation. And I think uh, certainly in the last in the last discussions uh, with Graham and, and Nikos uh, when we talked about the uh, the what what vir the virtual world has opened up to us. And I think this type of training you can do on board uh, from, from the office. You know, a reminder of how things go wrong, learning lessons, missing lookout on bridge at night. It's still happening. It's so, it's so obviously um, uh, avoidable. Uh, the silencing of navigation alarms, alarm fatigue. Uh, we, we all, we've all, we've all, you know, as, as sh have bridges have got more modern, there's more alarms. And it's being able to identify the important ones and ignore the others. Pull the third mate out of his bed to answer the non-important ones or help you on the bridge. That kind of incentivization on board on the ship should be there. And that can only come through training uh, and through messages from the top. Okay, fantastic. And yeah, um, I agree fully that uh, we, we do see this, the old problems. Uh, we need to re we need to remember them when we get we have talk, all this talk about data and uh, learning from uh, unsafe acts, unsafe conditions. The minor incidents might be getting taken care of, but we are still seeing high impact, low frequency incidents in our business. Um, Chris, yeah, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad Stuart brought it up uh, regarding the sort of differences differences in training that you know can be experienced, for, you know, from various providers or flag or STCW. I think from my point of view on this, you know, and it's maybe going to be slightly controversial, but hopefully not. Everyone sort of hangs their hat on training. Yeah, okay, we need more training, need more training. But for me, it really comes down to more competency management. You know, it's all very well sending someone off in a training course, which, you know, is absolutely important. But I think it was Stuart again that mentioned that talking about buy-in, you want people to buy in to why they're attending this training, why we're, you know, why they're getting sent on this, why they're having to do this refresher course. And it all comes down to competency. You know, we talk about safety outcomes, and we're probably going to touch on this later on. No one wakes up in the morning and thinks, I'm going to go out and I want to hurt myself. No one thinks that. What you have is, you know, human error. Why is that error there? Is it due to lack of training or is it more due to lack of competence? You know, just attending training doesn't mean 
that you're now competent to operate that equipment. It was one of the, uh, this all comes, I worked offshore for a number of years and it, it's really, really tied in to how platforms and FPSOs and everything works where they talk about competency management. And one of the, uh, we had the competency assurance team come out to one platform that I was working on and we're talking about, we're here to verify your competence and all that. And, you know, I went into my desk and I threw out my Master Mariner's license at them and said, there you go, right, there's my, that's how my competency is verified. And it was the best put down that I've ever had where they said, no, that's not competency, that's a license. Doesn't make you competent. It means you've been able to pass a set of exams. It doesn't mean that you're competent to work on this installation. It doesn't mean you're competent to work within our risk management system. So it's driving that into an industry where it has been a little bit tick box, you know, right, okay, so you've attended your STCW refresher training, well done, here's your license. So it's, we have to get to meaningful, impactful training. How do we get there? How do we get to that? Well, we really need to get back into, and I'm gonna sound like a bit of a broken record here, so apologies, but we really have to get into the data. So what? where are we seeing these incidents? What are, what are we looking at? Where's the sort of leading and lagging indicators? What is it that we are specifically getting wrong? You know, is it a gap in knowledge? Is it a gap in understanding? Is it an issue with the equipment? Is it an issue with procedures? It's driving, you know, getting right into it in terms of, you know, that competency management. Yeah, that's so, certainly one. Sorry, you go, Mike. Sorry. So it, I, essentially, there's a, there's a perception that training matrices are there for the, the company's own due diligence rather than for the growth and skills development of the individuals under a competence management framework is that is that essentially yeah i mean so ultimately you know if we take the lng trades what do we need right okay so you'll have experience matrices where you talk about the person's got to have x amount of time in rank x amount of time on lng that doesn't make that person competent that just means that person has been on a vessel right so that you know you could have done 100 cargo operations you could have done none you know when you were at anchor all that time so it's the verification of that competence the the regulation and what you need isn't enough it's not enough to you know that is the minimum requirement that you need to work on a vessel you know as a owner operator of lng it's the next level up it's verifying that your workforce is competent skilled and trained to have flawless operations deliver hydrocarbons from point a to point b do not have navigation incidents that's that's where we have to sort of get back to you know have it and but not just tick box it has to be verified it has to be assured you know we have to make sure that on one ship it's the same competence verification that's happening on another excellent excellent katie you were nodding there uh, I, I trust you're in agreement it's music to my ears. Um, you know, we are turning our eye at the MCA to how we can actually modernise seafarers training. Um, you know, the future of shipping is going to become more and more technical. We've got automation, electronic systems to support decision making. And with all of these new systems and new technologies, we need to revitalise the training programmes to make sure that we meet the industry needs and people are properly equipped to run ships safely. Um, I like the word competence, that's a key part to all of this. Um, one of the reasons that, it's, that we started this work in the MCA is we are deeply concerned about the quality of training that individuals are receiving. So we really have brought in an educational specialist who joined me in um, January, and we're really gonna start looking at a review of maritime education and how we can improve maritime education and for me i think i'd like to see us move to a more outcome-based education system not just a sit in the classroom tick box tick box we need to really make sure that the boys and girls are being trained with quality education so and one of the positives of covid is it's allowed us to explore all different alternative ways of providing education so there's an awful lot to learn from other industries. People have mentioned it, you know, the offshore industry, the pharmaceutical, the aviation. So I really do feel that the time has come that we've got a duty to ourselves. If we're serious about safety, then we really do need to look at the CFOs training and make sure that we are delivering quality training. And as Chris and Stuart said, and that's got to be around making sure that people are 
competent. It's not just a tick box exercise. Mm, absolutely. You, you mentioned there that COVID uh, has introduced new ways of delivering training. I suppose the other side of the coin is that with with the impact of COVID, many operators in-house training centres have been closed for the last nearly 11 months. So I think as an industry in 2021 and 2022 and maybe in 2023, we're going to be playing catch up with some of these internal and uh, non-statutory um, value adds training that we that we that we provide. Um, there's some, there's some great there's some, still some great comments coming in um, on on the chat there, and I think a point that really sums it up um, from uh, what we've discussed so far was from from Brian Horsburgh about the, moving the shift away from who went wrong to what went wrong. I think we're all talking about the same the same focus on human performance and this competence. Uh, management that uh, Chris was talking about and of course OCIMF have released a competence management framework as well um, to, to be to be uh, adopted it's all it's all pushing the focus on to growing the individuals and empowering the individuals it's it's all fantastic okay um, Mike can I just make a, yes. a comment on, on, on just on this particular just very quickly uh, it's so important that when things go right, that that's also yeah. followed up and reported on. Because uh, the answer of when things go right, the, the, why, the reason it's gone right is because the training is, 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 is right, is correct, and it's worked for those people on board. And so not just the captain as the leader you've got, whoever's on the bridge or on the engine or whatever in the scenario, they're all incentivized to be leaders. It's hugely important that they, in their, in their, in their scenario, they know when to stand back and they know when to call for help. And uh, it's a shame that we don't sort of champion the safety of shipping. There's happily, I mean, you just have to look at the international group report that's out on the website at the moment. Uh, horrendous, uh, horrendous uh, 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 figures there as regards, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, incidents with pilots on board. So there's a, a report just released $1.8 billion in claims. But actually, when you look at, when you think about the number of, pilotage movements around the world in one single day. It's not actually that common, but when they go wrong, of course, they're hugely expensive and, and, and can be and, and, and can and result in injury and death, of course, as well. But generally, uh, it, it's, a, it's a safe industry uh, and training has improved so much. I mean, I look at what's been happening out there and what's going on now. It really is very, very good. It just needs to a little bit of tweaking, I think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if I may, Mike, as well, that's a great point, Stuart. I think, you know, as an industry, what we are really good at, and I wouldn't use the word apportion and blame or anything like that, but we really focus on when it goes wrong, you know, look at that, look what's happened, how has that happened, why it's went happening. And absolutely, we should be doing that, you know, what's went wrong, how can we prevent it from happening next time around? But a little bit remiss sometimes on what's went right, why has it went right, you know, how can we replicate what's went right there across the, uh, either the industry or the other company vessels, you know, the amount of moorings that we have, the amount of pilotages we have, main engine maintenance, all of this where people go and do the job and it's done safely and everything gets put back to the, together as it should. And it's, you know, we have, for us, we're now looking at a just culture model where you talk, you know, you look at, yeah, okay, it's what happens when it goes wrong, but on the top end of the line, you've also got what happens when it goes right and the rewards that people get for that and how these best practices are implemented. But you're absolutely right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, again, um, another point that Brian's come in with about focusing on the individuals. Um, when, it, when incidents happen, we can't assume that bad things happen because we've got bad people. And if we fix that bad person, that that, that incident will never happen again. We have to look at the wider what has happened. And I think that's, Chris, you mentioning there, a just and fair culture. And I know that Katie, the MCA, are, are reviewing this right now because the Safety Culture Working Group have been asked to support that. Um, but having this just and, just and fair culture adopted um, within your organisation does ensure that you're not looking at, looking at an individual or, the, or that bad person to give it a phrase, but looking at what went wrong more holistically and from a system uh, based of view. Because the the seafarer at the end of the day, at the sharp end of the business, um, is at the heart of the negative event. 
but that is not does not mean that the seafarer is the causal factor. The, the causal factor is it could be many links down the error chain, which could be ashore, it could be design. So uh, taking Brian's point, we do absolutely all need to adopt this just and fair culture to ensure that we're focusing on the what rather than the who. Okay. Yeah, yeah, if I could just come in there, Mike, and this is a really valid point, it's just culture is really important. And I'm afraid to say historically, shipping has had a blame culture. I've seen it myself when I've been on board doing port state control and you're about to detain a vessel and you can see the poor captain's heart sink because it's highly likely he will be following me down the gangway. Mm. Um, I think it's got a lot better, but I just think this just culture bit is really, really important. It's about providing people with a safe environment to put their hands up and say, this has gone wrong or this is about to go wrong. What can we do to rectify it? And, you know, we've enforced it within the MCA and it's changed the whole environment to a huge place. So I just would really like to emphasise that this just culture piece is really critical in actually getting us to the place we want to be with safety. Because when you have a blame culture, people hide things. And when you hide things, we don't learn anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great point and, and Stuart talked about recognizing the good so that's 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 the key here is that you you recognize the the safe behaviors and the unsafe behaviors and you you know you address the unsafe behaviors and you reward and recognize the safe and that builds the reporting culture um we are we are going to we are going to come on to that in a, in a short while but Stuart, you're nodding again. Is this is this is this the point you were referring to? This just and fair culture. No, absolutely. Yeah, you, you summed it up well. Okay, okay. Um, so let's. I'll just before we move into the next question because it is a slight change of tact. I'll just uh, have a look to see if there's uh, some questions here and uh, that have come in that are relevant to the point we're talking about just now. Um, Chris, Christopher Roberts has asked that we've been more and more successful in preventing um, minor accidents and incidents at sea, but the, really the major accidents are still happening, if with less regularity. Can we ever reach goal zero? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll take a go at that. First, yes, we've talked a lot on this in this seminar already about the high-low project and focusing on the high-impact, low-frequency incidents. And if you listen to the statistics that are coming out of the high-low organization, they are making a material difference in reducing the high-impact, low-frequency incidents. Um, Chris mentioned at the beginning of this discussion about a 70% drop in total losses. So as an industry, we're on, a, we're on that journey. We're not there yet for sure and there's still an awful lot of work that we need to do as an industry to collaborate and share and certainly the high-low project is is one of these events is there anybody on the panel that would also like to address this question from christopher roberts no i think you've um, you've summed that up well there mike i mean ultimately yeah high-low is is doing some great work and it's the thing is when you talk about major incidents or significant incidents it's not it's very rarely just one company or one ship it involves a whole plethora of other you know a, a chain of events that's happened whether it's a collision or you know malfunctioning equipment that sends causing an equipment fire so yeah i would i would agree we are we are on a path to reduction i think people always get a little bit, I wouldn't say, you know, or you you can never get zero. You can never, you know, that's an impossible, it's an unrealistic target. But it's got to be, it's, it's, that's got to be the target. Of course, it's got to be zero. You don't want anyone to be hurt on any of the, you know, no one should be injured when they go to their work. That just should not happen. You should be able to, you know, go to sea and come back in the same condition you left. Or in some cases, hopefully better, you know, if the welfare is good, good gyms, etc. But you know that should always be the target. It should, you can't have anything other than that. That's a great point, Chris. My brother still works at sea, and uh, he he comes back much leaner and fitter than when he went <laughs> when he joins the ship. Um, okay, um, uh, Stuart, Katie, anything further to add on that point? No. Okay. I don't think so, other than to say that uh, you, uh, you have to aim for the top, don't you? Otherwise, there's no point aiming for anything. Uh, you aim for the top. Humans will make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes. I think it's about mitigating 
that mitigating the chance of it uh, having being surrounded by people if you make a mistake it'll be picked up by other people around you who are who have the, the culture on board to raise it raise the fact that you've made a mistake that's important whether you're the captain or the galley boy that's that's absolutely fantastic because that is the, the main point about accepting that everybody will make mistakes and then you can make error tolerant systems around that so great thank you for that Okay, the, the next point that was presented to us um, from the Chamber for discussion is would a rebalance of the management and owning entity relationship create a more focused safety culture? Um, obviously, being from third party management, I twitched a little bit when I saw this question, but let me have a, a go at answering it and then I'll open it up to the floor. Certainly from our point of view, the safety culture is a journey that needs and it needs a partnership between owners and managers and that's whether that manager is in-house or third party they have to the uh, the relationship one needs the other they're interdependent and you will only be successful if we're all pulling in the same direction and and some of our best performing fleets are where owners and managers are working together to drive forward safe operations ensuring that the fleet sells uh, and those on board have the, all the resources and the support and empowerment that they need. So it's extremely important that you also have a clear and shared um, sense of values between the owners and the, the managers. And and that evaluation starts on day one, uh, well, even before day one, during any sort of new business risk um, evaluation. Do we get it right all the time? No, we don't. Um, but in answer to the question that the Chamber has presented us, certainly from our view, uh, to achieve long-term success, owners and managers need to be a partnership to build a sustainable safety culture. Um, is that, it's difficult to pitch this question. Uh, Chris, yeah, from an owner-operator point of view? I think, Mike, funnily enough, when I seen the question as well, I was, you know, I was like, ooh, at the uh, <laughs> I think, and you hit the nail on the head with that one, pulling in the same direction, you know, ultimately that's what it has to be. You know, if you've got an, if you're a ship manager and you've got an owner that only cares about OPEX, that only cares about, you know, how much they're, they're going to squeeze out their particular asset, then you're already on the road to ruin with that. You really need owners to, to buy in to the fact that if they have a healthy, safety conscious, sustainable workforce, it's only going to be good for their asset, you know, and for yourself, Mike, that therein lies the challenge for for ship management. You know, it's all very well for me to sit here and say, you know, at TK we are prudent owners and we we you know we really do genuinely care about our workforce, etc. But we all know that there, there are owners out there that don't, you know, and they have the profit profit hat on. And that's all it is. I think as um, ship managers, it's up to you guys to turn them around on that and really demonstrate as to why, it, you know, having this ethos and having this, you know, permeated safety culture is a good thing. It is an absolute good thing. And, turn, you know, turn them around on the world view of profit at all costs. So, yeah, it's, it is tough. And if you're not, if you aren't pulling in the same direction, then, yeah, it's incredibly challenging. Um, Stuart, I know this question doesn't necessarily apply uh, to yourself, but obviously with uh, your your company insuring 3,000 assets, do you have any views on this? Do you see any sort of gold, the gold standards? Um, I think that the the old work, I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of people use it, don't they? Mm -hmm. A happy ship safe is a safe ship. A safe ship is a is a profitable ship. Uh, I think um, if ma managers and owners, I mean, we see so many different attitudes towards uh, safety. But I think with the industry moving together, I was just looking mm -hmm. up the other day about the you know the dry bulk management standard. Of course, mm -hmm. tankers have raised raised the bar hugely. Um, you, know, you have to run your ship in a very safe way to get a good charter in layman terms. Uh, so it's kind of taken taken the uh, incent or it's taken the, the, the decision out of the CEO's uh, uh, strategy because if you want to make money, you have to have a safe ship. Mm -hmm. 
um, that that hasn't really worked uh, so well um, with in the dry, dry bulk sector. But that's not to say that there isn't very very good operators in the dry bulk sector. There are, um, but with this dry bulk management standard, you know, it's voluntary, it's self assessment, it's looking to me, not having researched it too too thoroughly, almost touching on the sort of TMSA side of things. If you want a good regular, you know, charter. You, you, you can demonstrate that now through the, the, the dry bulk management standard. Um, I think that's fantastic. So I think we're all moving in the right way and I think that will influence managers and operators. And uh, it's, a, it's a good point and I can see my old friend John right there on the chat, very prolific there with his, the messages, but John has been an advocate for many, many years that good safety is good business and some of the work that John did in Canada with the BC Ferry project uh, did set the standard for uh, workforce engagement and driving business performance through good safety. So thank you, John, for your contributions. Um, Katie, anything more on this question from a regulatory point of view? It's a difficult one. I, I, I... It's a difficult one for me as a regulator. Yeah. I mean, look, I would echo what you said, Mike, it's for us, the key bit is the safety and it's just making sure that those owners, managers, operators are all aligned with the same and they're not pulling against each other, you know. I'm not so naive to not realise that there is always financial is driving this, but it's just really key that those people that are responsible for those vessels and that those owners understand what the key role of safety is and actually how it can improve their business. It doesn't mean that it means I'm not having to stomp on their decks every other yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's uh, let's move on. Then the, the the final question that we've been given from the chamber to discuss is: Are operators and crew incentivized sufficiently to deliver incident-free, safe operations? And I and I know from um, from Mel telling us as a question, and that do you have any practical examples of how to reward and take notice of positive safety behaviours? So. Does, would anybody like to take the, the baton on this question? I would just say, my from my perspective, mm -hmm. incentives don't have to necessarily be financially driven. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for vessels operating on the UK flag, you know, we are looking to a risk-based approach for our, when we do our flag inspection, so the inspections that we do separate to the statutory. So there's a benefit there, and I've just mentioned it, you know, if you are running what when we model you based on your inspection history, if you are running what we qualify as low risk vessels, you enjoy a much more light touch approach from a, a regulatory point of view. And again, that is just, you know, the benefits of that are, I mean, as, as, as Graham mentioned earlier, you know, they have got reduced amount of inspections going on board their vessels. It just alleviates them when they're in port. So there are added benefits equally. Um, you know, we are working hard to maintain the standard of the UK flag and we're doing really well in the Paris MEU. Mm -hmm. We've managed to keep our core ship 21. That's all added benefits to operators. If they're running good, high quality, safe ships, they they find themselves being recognised around the world and it just alleviates that constant pressure of port state control walking up the gangway every time they're in, in port. So I think from my point of view, there is an incentive. It doesn't necessarily have to be fiscal. Fiscal incentives actually sometimes drive bad behaviours. And the question, the, the, the question that was raised, you know, recognising positive impact, that's something that operators can can do on board and it's just small gestures of recognizing an individual when they've done something that's having a positive impact on the safety on board the vessel. That, that's a great point and, and taking that last point out for go over to Chris and Stuart is that what we do is that we have a, a reward and recognition program in our fleet that's in, in every office every month the shore management team um, takes submissions from the fleet on the best near miss or the best unsafe act or unsafe condition and then they they announce that that that, that person is the safety catch of the month winner and then they share the, the the person's photograph across the fleet they get a certificate and a letter of appreciation from the md of that office uh, and we share the lesson learned that that individual has raised so that we share the lessons learned from the the leading event 
uh, we reward and recognize the individual that raised it and we also promote the reporting culture across the whole fleet to say that you know raising these these interventions this stop work authorities these report little reports they matter they really matter and they they could potentially stop the high impact uh, low frequency incident from occurring so from a very small little report from from the ab or the messman on one ship it gets shared it could potentially get shared across 100 600 ships so it's a it's a great point incentivization doesn't need to be monetary it can be through reward and recognition um chris um, what are your thoughts on this yeah, great point. Uh, absolutely. You know, you see the words incentivize and you immediately, I'm guilty of it myself, you think, you know, how much money am I going to get with that? <laughs> it's it's interesting, a couple of years ago, uh, TK, we done a, a bit of an internal study to sort of have a bit of surveys to find out where we're, where we were going with this. And we found that basic factors uh, were learned very early in life, such as doing the right thing, stopping somebody from doing something unsafe being there for our families and to avoid being injured, that was considered far more impactful than any any money that can be given. Mike, you raised it, you know, and talking about recognition of, you know, good practices and what people are doing on board. I think it's very easy for people to sit ashore and forget how impactful that really is. You know, if an AB or anyone on ship has came up with a great idea to see that their name gets pushed out to the fleet to, you know, their idea has now been incorporated into the management system. It's incredibly impactful. You know, that is it's such it's such a positive thing to do. And we talk about incentivize, but it's not only it's not the fact of, you know, you wake up in the morning, you go and do, do your job. The other in, incentive for all of this is you're working for a company that's sustainable. You know, Stuart talked about it earlier on with in the tanker game, you know, if you don't have a good safety record, you won't get a charter. That's absolutely true. You know, if you're in a if you're in a company where you have a poor track safety record, you are flagged up in oil companies' veteran insurance departments. You will not be taken if your vessel's on the spot. You just won't be. For LNG, it's the case of you won't get uh, involved in projects, be it Qatar expansion or whatever the case may be because you're considered to be a poor operator. And that's why if we were to go down the fiscal path where, you know, ships are rewarded, uh, you know, they get a safety bonus in terms of money, you run, there's a real, real risk then that nothing's reported. And Katie talks about it where, you know, you don't learn. Everything's driven then underground. No one's going to know because it's going to financially implicate you. What you really, what the big incentive for us, what we want is every single employee is pulling for TK. Every single employee wakes up in the morning and thinks, I'm delighted to be here. I want to, you know, make the company as attractive uh, for new business so that my future is safe, my family's, you know, looked after. That that's the that's your driver, you know, the fact that you're looking after the company, obviously. But the other key one is as well, and again you can forget about this ashore. It's about the person sat next to you. Right? You know, the reason, you know, when you're on watch in the 12 to 4, the reason you're doing what you're doing is you're protecting the 30 people that are sleeping underneath, you know, and that's another incentive. You know, you're looking after your shipmates, you're looking after your colleagues. So I think, you know, it's important that that is recognised and we do do better at pushing that out in terms of, you know, either formalising it or how we communicate it much better. You know, ultimately, priorities change where uh, values don't. So striving to have a great positive safety culture, that will in invariably, learn, you know, lead to incident-free operations, and that's that's the incentive, you know, and it's getting that message across. Yeah, and I can see from the chat there that uh, there's a lot of support for for what you've just said there, and I think we've talked a lot about human factors and human performance on this, and we're all we're all human. We all, as a basic need, want to be appreciated. We all want to feel empowered, and we all want to feel involved. Um, and you know, push those buttons, and we we feel good. Uh, we feel incentivized to do a good job, to get up in the morning and go the extra mile, go the extra mile for the business, go the extra mile for for safety. Um, it's it's just appealing to the basic fundamentals of being a human being is what incentivizes us. Stuart, um, anything, any cl closing comments on this question from you? 
Yeah, I'd love to. And I'm glad Chris mentioned that at the end, because uh, one wonderful thing about being at a P&I club is that you are, you are privy to what other operators, what, what different operators are doing, because we involve ourselves with it. Um, and um, it's interesting, you know, I think loyalty, uh, we're talking about loyalty, uh, and it doesn't take much. I had a, I had a chat with, a, with a, a psychologist who was telling me about, um, uh, uh, after he got through my personal issues, he told, <laughs> no, we, we spoke about, uh, uh, you know, the reaction of, of people. Now, I think, and he, he, he brought up uh, the way, you know, he's, he brought up, when you look at, say, tug crews and barge crews in America, they've all got baseball caps on with the company name and their name. Uh, you know, you go into the galley and there's a mug with the, the company's logo on it. And it makes people part of the feel part of the team. Now, I've seen this with members. I won't mention the names, but just having, you know, the old fashioned crockery on the ship used to have the ship's logos on them. My grandfather used to come back with a few mugs. Uh, but, you know, just little things like that. A boiler suit with your name on it and, and a logo, um, you know, it doesn't cost a lot, but it affects people and it makes them feel part of, you know, 30 quid at Marks and Spencer's voucher at the end of the term. It, it's just nice. A letter from the CEO. And it's, um, you know, um, it, if you want to spend more money on it, we see we see companies, you know, involving families. So when there is an officers conference, bring the wife along. Um, you know, it's why not? Yeah. Uh, it makes the wife feel part of the team as well, uh, to a certain extent. Um, you know, the, the addition of um, health care for the family. These types of things help. It makes people want the company to succeed and it makes them want to be safe on board the ship and follow the, follow, follow the, the, the culture of the, of the company. And we see a lot of this and it's really good um, to see that. Yeah, so I'm just, just picking up on that, it's funny, that's exactly what we were talking about a few weeks ago. You know, the branding, getting people to really buy into it, all of that. So yeah, absolutely, fully, fully agree. Okay, um, thank you for that. And there's some again, there's still some great chat going on on the side there. Uh, Mel's passed us through a couple of questions that that we need to uh, round off. Uh, one question is from Leanne Pitts. Uh, Within the human element, how do you manage the different cultural approaches to safety? Um, and it's, it's a great question, uh, you know, V-Ships, many different nationalities and as Stuart across the UK P&I Club, you must have the same. Um, is there any best practices that you've seen for managing different cultures? Is there any, cults, obviously there are cultural differences from one nationality to another, but Leanne's question is, within the human element, how do you manage the different cultural approaches to safety? Well, the great thing about this question is it applies across the human race. Uh, so whether you're flying planes or running taxi cabs uh, or running ships, uh, how do you deal with the culture? And happily, I live in a country that's embracing different cultures and it's a wonderful place to live. Mm -hmm. And so um, it is it is something that sadly a lot of people need some training on. And we still see issues. Uh, the, the authoritarian northern European master and the not so uh, and sort of timid second officer from maybe uh, somewhere else, uh, and it's and it is an issue. And I've heard of members who have had problems. And you know, sometimes if you can't get over it as a sixty-year-old captain or a fifty-five-year-old captain, maybe maybe your time's up with that company. If you can't, you know, because there's fantastic training on it, mm -hmm. and it should come naturally, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and if that if that drive is from the top. I think I'm repeating myself too much here. Uh, it, it will work, yeah. and you know, sad to say, there are some people out there that just can't deal with it, and maybe it's time that you, you know, you're not, you have to find yourself another company or find yourself another career, and that's an improvement. That's a huge improvement from the times when you know I can still remember I wasn't allowed to speak on the bridge as a cadet. Uh, I worked on a Dutch ship where everyone spoke Dutch, and that was it. You know. Um, uh, and that's two Northern Europeans. So mm -hmm. it's it it's not there so much anymore, but it but we do see it being an issue. Certainly with pilots coming on board as well. Mm. I think the one the one piece of practical advice that for, sort of from our side would be is that you need to understand the what what the what the safety climate is in your in your business. Um, and what, yeah. one of the exercises that we do is every two or three years we do we work with industrial psychologists at Lloyd's Register and do a full safety climate across the whole organization 
to identify, and then you can split up the demographics, which which uh, culture, which nationalities, which demographics within your business are good at reporting, not so good. There are perceptions of risk, um, leadership, and you really get a good breakdown across your whole organization by rank, by nationality, by vessel type. The demographics are endless, but it really helps you manage the safety culture discussion. Everybody, we are at the end of our allotted time and uh, I need, need to draw this discussion to a close, but I would like to say a, a great thanks to Katie, to Stuart and to Chris um, for their participation today. A great uh, thanks to Mel for keeping us steering in the right direction throughout all of this. Um, with our WhatsApp messages, I haven't been I haven't been playing uh, Sudoku. I've been engaging with Mel throughout the whole the whole session. So thank you, Mel, uh, and thank you everybody for the chat that's that has been coming in. It's been really really fantastic. Great. Thank you everybody. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.